My name is Inyoma and I welcome everyone to the November edition of the Digital Africa VIP series. This leadership series is a platform to identify, showcase and share the personal stories, experience and impact of tech players and policymakers as shining examples for Africa and Africans to emulate. We are privileged to have on our series today a man with quite an enviable track record of achievement in the course of a career that has spanned four decades and has cut across global companies, local organizations, and startups. Tommy Davis has touched everything. He is a systems analyst turned tech strategy advisor, public speaker, and an angel investor. He wears several caps, including collaborator in chief at Technovision, chief investment officer at Green Tech Capital Partners, co-founder of the Lagos Angel Network, and the president of the he is also a board member of the global business angels network tommy davies we are pleased to have you on our series today so i will just start with a question for nearly two decades after your graduation from the university of miami you led the implementation of innovative technology-led transformation initiatives for influential global brands like el facutain Max and Spencer, Ernst and Young, and Sapient across Europe, the United States, and Southeast Asia. What was it that motivated you to shift your focus to Africa? Um, well, first of all, uh, one of those companies, although French, was actually operating in Nigeria, which is uh, where I started, to be honest. Um, I went to uh, secondary school in Lagos, um, both King's and St. Gregory's College, uh, before proceeding to the United States, and then um, <clears throat> actually came back and did my youth corps at Elf. Um, it was my dad's death that took me to Europe, and after spending a decade with some of the brands you mentioned, um, Marks and Spencer, Ernst and & Young, and Sapient, I felt it was time to come home, especially given that um, democracy had returned to Nigeria under President Obasanjo. So that was sort of the trigger. We were all excited about building a new and better Nigeria. So there wasn't any point sitting in London telling people what to do in Nigeria when you could go there and roll your sleeves up and um, be part of uh, the transformation. So that's, that's what triggered the move back was, um, you know, the return to democracy of uh, of the Nigeria of Nigeria as a country. Okay, and then you landed in Africa with a bank, helping to create the African Agriculture Technology Foundation (AATF), leading the One Laptop Per Child (OLPC) initiative in Nigeria, and delivering a World Bank pilot of the Integrated Payroll and Personnel Information Systems (IPPIS) yeah. that uncovered over twenty thousand ghost workers in the Nigerian government payroll system. Tell us about your most rewarding experience doing all these, as well as the greatest challenges you faced and how you overcame them. Well, uh, actually, both of them are tied to the same project, which is still very, very close to my heart. Um, in, oh, I think 2004 or 2005, I can't remember now, uh, a friend, I'd, I'd befriended a certain professor uh, out of MIT in my role as head of IT for Marks and Spencer. And he came up with a concept called the One Laptop Per Child Initiative, where he designed what we now call um, netbooks. Okay. Um, he designed this uh, netbook concept. And the idea was because the internet and computers were going to be pervasive, um, on the privileged children in developing countries who, whose parents and governments couldn't afford the laptops we use would be able to have access to the internet through these machines. Um, we, all, we were all enamored by Nicholas's uh, solution. And I remember at that time, I was uh, actually running a consultancy in Abuja and um, the then Minister of Education was very, very interested in this also and said, oh, you know, I'm going to go along with um, the EVC to NCC and Eston Dukwe and a few others to WCSIS where this was being presented. I said, no, we can actually do that here. Um, we managed to get Nicholas to come uh, 
to Nigeria. He met with President Obasanjo, and President Obasanjo was quite enamored by the project. He ordered a million laptops for um, Nigerian children uh, to be deployed into Nigerian schools. And that was the first order that the project got, which is why till today, those machines are colored green, white, green in the color of the Nigerian uh, flag. Nicholas was excited, so were we. We started work, held all kinds of sessions, um, and we were, we were getting ready to go uh, when I hit the buffer winds of uh, the Nigerian uh, civil service. I don't think I can call them the evil service on record, but um, <laughs> uh, they were not prepared to write a check of $100 million because uh, it was $100 laptop, $1 million, that's $100 million, um, without, without uh, the Nigerians in the team doing the proper thing as far as they were concerned. Um, I pretty much told them to go to hell, and they did go to hell with my project. And that was the end of uh, the One Laptop Per Child project in Nigeria. We subsequently took it to Rwanda, and uh, you know what happened. You've seen the growth of Rwanda based on that project since then. Mm -hmm. However, um, I was not going to take it, you know, just roll over. Um, I was privileged to run into a lady called Carolyn Hall, MBE. Um, who um, partnered with me and we formed Laptops for Learning, which we took out of public sector and went straight to the private sector. We managed to get people like the Leventis Foundation, the Flower Mills Foundations and others to fund uh, Laptops for Learning, which actually turned 10 years old um, last month. So uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, we managed to set up Laptops for Learning and that provides screen-based learning to the uh, bottom of the pyramid children who otherwise would not have access to technology and the internet, the children of the house boys, the house girls, you know, the street cleaners and people of that nature. So we put those into their schools. So that's sort of been the biggest, uh, the one I feel, feel the best about is the fact that these kids are now coming out of these schools uh, digitally literate uh, or because we made the effort to, although, you know, the failure of making it pervasive still hurts. Thank you. Yeah, I can see the I can see the excitement excitement on your face with regards to the success of um, what the, the laptop program. So now look, let's look at your personal mission, which is to help drive Africa's development by supporting young entrepreneurs using innovation and technology to create social impact and economic value. So I was having a, a conversation with Mrs. Field about you, and she shared her first experience of meeting you in two thousand and three and working with you during the Chogum and the visit of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth to Nigeria. Oh, gotcha. That encounter totally transformed how her company worked, boosted productivity for her company, and helped cement their leadership in the events industry at that time. As she has followed you through the years, she has also seen that passion evolve into your work as an angel investor. What is angel investment really about and how does it work? Ah, angel investing is about um, really people who have um, a little bit of disposable income. I'm not talking of a significant amount, but um, people who, you know, um, aren't looking for their next meal, uh, literally speaking, um, and feel comfortable enough in their skin with what they have, um, deciding to help to build the city they belong to. So uh, note my specificity with words, um, using their expertise and their experience to invest personal capital into the next generation of entrepreneurs. Now, personal capital comprises of three things. The first, which is the cheapest, is cash. So angel investors actually invest cash, and typically they will invest cash either for equity or for debt. In the case of debt, it's typically what we call a convertible note because we couldn't have thought through uh, some of the fundamentals at that stage. The second is connection, and that's reputational risk. The ability to connect these startups, these entrepreneurs to business networks they might otherwise not have access to. And the third and the final, which is the most important, is mentoring and advisory. So providing them with the right kind of guidance that is knowledge-based 
to enable them to succeed. It is people who do all those three, different quantums, different mechanisms, that are called angel investors. Okay, so are there good angels and bad angels? How do startups identify the good angels? All right, a bad angel is anybody that wants to take 50% of your company for giving you money. I don't care how much they're giving you. If they give, even if they're giving you 100 million and they want 51% of your company, then that's not angel investing. Angels typically take a small, okay? And when I say small, I don't think there's any company other than one that I'm in that I own more than 10%. So you're typically looking for a small percentile, okay? And you're typically looking to provide value to get them uh, to where they need to be. So you're, you're just like, they listen out to understand if this is a good investment. You've also got to, as an entrepreneur, listen out to say, does this investor fit my profile? It's, it's a two-way street because it's just like a marriage. Okay, both of you have to agree on the parameters of how you are going to build a startup that is your child together. Oh, nice. So is there a rule of thumb for startups and small businesses to attract investment? Um, this question stems from the reality that in spite of different kinds of funds available for startups, there are millions and one looking for funding. Well, yes. Um, I, I now, with my, I have a syndicate that I co-invest with, um, and we have an investment thesis. So the thing is, you need to understand what the thesis is of the investors you are approaching. What kind of companies are they looking for? Are they looking for high growth companies or are they looking for high value companies? Um, are they looking for companies in your industry segment? Are they looking for companies at your stage? Because you have idea stage, then you have the minimum viable product. After you've got your minimum viable product, you start growing customers to where you can get product market fit. Hopefully you get to growth, you scale, and you're on to CVZ. And throughout that life journey, different investors pick different stages where they feel most comfortable to support um, the startup and the entrepreneur to get to the next stage. So I, for example, I will pick you up post MVP. If you don't have any customers, I really can't help you. But once you have a few customers and you're trying to figure out how do I develop what we call my growth engine, that is, you know, you've got a value engine defined in the business model. How do I now start my growth engine to start to get things to grow? That's where people like myself come in best handy um, before you get to starting to look at, oh, we want to scale, okay? By the time you're scaling, you're beyond my competence. So it's about understanding where does this investor actually provide, you know, the best benefit for me? And then once you understand that, being sure that they can see the value in where you're trying to get to, because don't forget, it's, the, it's a journey, okay? And what you have today is not what you're gonna have tomorrow. The idea is, can we grow together? Definitely. Could you share with us some of your investment success stories and maybe some that failed? Oh, right. Well, investment success stories. Um, I think I've overdone the striker investment story, but I, I, I like telling it, especially given that this year, um, striker, which is my very first angel investment, became a Disney property. Oh. Um, so it's a Cinderella story where my friend Oliver Power uh, we were both in the UK together when I was at Marks and Spencer. He went to South Africa where Mandela went in and I came to Nigeria. And they came up with the idea of doing a comic, um, a fantasy. Uh, at that time, it was going to be a superheroes comic. I managed to convince and it became a fantasy league soccer comic. Um, became very, very popular. We managed to get publication up to, I think, about 16, 17 countries. Um, and finally started an animated series. I did a partial exit in 2008, and I got, at that time, nearly 50x uh, for half my shares. Last year, we sold to Moonberg, and I got, again, the same time, so 100x deal uh, for me. And the striker is now in 19 countries, publication. It's got its own YouTube channel. Um, that's doing amazingly well. That's why Moonbog purchased it. And like I said, uh, March of this year, I think it was Moonbog finally sold it to to Stryker. So I mean, that's that's a nice story in and of itself. Although it took forever to mature. If you look at my friends who went into Paystack in 2015, 
and came mm-hmm. out with the same multiples in five years, I'm envious. <laughs> <laughs> But then, you know, you talk about failures. I had, uh, I was all excited. The biggest failure, pay, no, not the biggest, the most painful failure I've had was a particular startup that um, caught my fancy. I managed, you know, to get in. And this is what I was saying about connections. Through connections, I tripled their revenue base inside a 90-day be- period. And we were going gangbusters when, unfortunately, the lead co-founder, a 26-year-old, died. And um, that was the end of that particular uh, investment. And of course, I've had people who I've invested in who I thought I'd done my due diligence disappear with my money. Sad. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's look at some fascinating statistics on startup failure rates in 2020. Um, 90% 90 of new startups fail, 75% of venture partners, 50% of businesses make it to their fifth year. 33% 33% of startups make it to the 10th year mark, and only 40% of startups actually turn a profit. What do you think are the reasons for these staggering results? Why do startups fail? Oh, come on. That's, that's very, very easy. The first thing is they're building something nobody wants. Okay? Yeah, it might be the best idea since sliced bread or what have you. And I tell people it's not the ideas. It's about whether people want it or not. So that's, that's, that to me is the primary reason startups fail is they go so far, but nobody really wants what they're doing. Uh, the second is uh, something that we're starting to experience more and more of in Nigeria, and that's talent. They just don't have the people to make a great idea work. Um, those are sort of the top two. Um, I know people would like to believe, oh, they didn't get the funding, but actually funding comes a distant space, okay, when you look at, you know, why startups in our environment fail, because invariably, if you are building and you're getting that traction and everything else, you know, there are quite a number of people that will find you. Definitely. So, uh, if I may ask, what are the industries? Sorry. mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just wanted to talk that up. in terms of building, you know, it's because startups are different to SMEs. Startups are in the innovation game. So they're typically doing something nobody else has done before. And that's why they don't know. If, Mm -hmm. for example, um, you want to put a Chinese restaurant into Asokoro, for example, it's easy Mm -hmm. because you know two or three people have done that. So all you're trying to do is figure, can I attract enough people to break even? That's an Mm -hmm. SME model. All right. Mm -hmm. But if, on the other hand, you're saying, you know, what I'd like to do is have virtual dining where we send Mm -hmm. people the food and then they put on their goggles and eat it in in an environment. Now, that's not been done by Mm -hmm. anybody. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know if anybody wants it. So (laughs) that's that's, that's sort of the difference um, and why you should heartily expect to see those failure rates in startups. The idea being the entrepreneur is learning as they go along. Yeah. Okay, so what are the industries with better success rates where anyone looking to invest should venture into? I keep, I keep getting asked this question and I say there's no such thing. Let me explain why I say there's no, no such thing. Where are the baddest problems we have on the continent? Because those are the ones where if you solve it, you make the most money and they're all around us, okay? If somebody solves electricity for Nigerians, they'll make a packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's a regulatory environment that doesn't enable it to happen. Look at what we've done with fintechs because somebody is solving the payment issue for Nigerians. Okay, so um, again, we've got the transport problem. Our roads could do with some fixing Um, and it goes on and on. So there isn't a one size fits all. It's a timing thing because investors tend to have what we call herd mentality. Why? Because Risk management is what investors do. You're you're concerned with three numbers. How much do I go in? Okay, how much do I get when I come out? And what's the time scale between the two? And in between that time, what am I bumping against? So those are the considerations investors are typically looking at. So when they hear, oh, FinTech is it, payments are it, you know, and look at what's happened in the last two to three years. So we've gone from Flutterwave to Paystack to, you know, you name it. And, and yeah. you start to see the trend. 
uh, people talk agri-tech, we all move into agri-tech and start talking about drones, doing fertilizer crop yield and, and what have you. Oh, renewables it is, everybody goes to renewables, let's start looking at solar yields. and, and re So that's why I say there isn't a singular industry, but some of the ones I've touched on, okay, are industries that, you know, are relatively, they're giving relatively decent yields um, to, to investors as, uh, as it happens. Um, but so that I don't come across as uh, non-committed, let, let me talk about the specific areas we're seeing money go into, not the ones I feel. So for example, financial inclusion, all right, is about half the money going into investment on the continent in startups right now. Online and mobile consumer services are second. Um, they take up about maybe about 25, uh, 30%. And then business to business and tech adoption takes up uh, a significant part of the rest. So if you look at those three and consider the financial inclusion, we're talking of FinTech, off-grid tech, insure tech, and the like, you can understand why, okay, they got a total investment of over a billion last year. Um, and when you look at online and mobile commerce, whether it's health tech, e-commerce, edu tech, you know, um, all of those, consider, even entertainment, then you, you can see where the half a billion dollars that went into them uh, is going. So that's, that's sort of a thumbnail sketch, which I hope helps. Okay, so with this sketch, can you give me an idea of how big and impactful Africa's startup industry is? Well, uh, I don't know about the impactful because uh, people are still working to try and understand exactly. For me, impact is jobs created, okay? So it's, it's one hard measure. And we're still trying to figure out how many jobs are being created by startups. They are in the tens of thousands, but nobody can actually say, here's the number. Um, I've got one of my protégés working, you know, and we should have something maybe uh, early next year. Um, but in terms of funding, uh, it depends on who you talk to. Partech Ventures tells us it's about $2 billion uh, that came in last year. Uh, Maxim Bayan says we've exceeded the $1 billion inbound again this year, even with COVID. So those are the numbers I, I, you know, because I have the sources, I tend to believe. Okay, so um, as of January 2020, there were over 600 unicorns that startup valued at 1 billion, billion US dollars and above mm -hmm. globally, majority of which are in the United States and China. What can Africa, when can Africa rise to birth unicorns and what do we need to do to make it happen? I'm on record that I disagree with the unicorn concept because it's non-African. I believe in gazelles, okay? Unicorn is a very American thing. That is, you build your company up to this stage and then you sell it off. We don't like selling our companies. Uh, we don't reward our investors that way. Uh, I have a startup where I'm actually getting dividends from. Well, I guess it's no longer a startup because they're paying dividends because they've broken even. I wouldn't encourage those kids to sell their company. They're doing gangbusters. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, a unicorn occurs when you've had a transfer of shares that values the company at over a billion dollars. Um, having said that, we will have unicorns. Um, we've got one already um, in, um, oh my God, it'll come to me. Uh, it's my friend, Michelle Elegbe's company. Uh, he's done an amazing job building it. Interswitch, okay. Um, Interswitch is a unicorn. Um, in sorry? In, in FinTech, yeah. Um, uh, I said InterSwitch, so... Yes, InterSwitch, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. With, the, with, the, with the investments they recently received, they're a unicorn. Although Cellulant is having its challenges, they are moving in that direction. Uh, you look at Flutterwave, they're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Paystack's $200 million acquisition tells you that if they continue their growth trajectory, if they can get to 200 million in five years, then if you assume uh, that we're talking of the hockey stick curve, then I'm expecting someone like Paystack on to increase the Stripe brand value by more than a billion, which, which qualifies them as a unicorn. And there are quite a number of others. Okay, so um, you are a member of the Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council, L-A-S-R-I-C. 
Can you tell us more about what the council does? Oh Lord, you've done your homework. Um, <laughs> uh, the Lagos State Science Research and Innovation Council seeks to expand the use of science, research, and innovation in the Lagos theater of operations, economic, financial, and political. And what we do, I chair the innovation uh, subcommittee. Uh, Peter Bancoli of the Enterprise Development Center chairs STEM, and we've got Professor Peter Anoktokai, who chairs uh, the research. Um, the council itself is chaired by Professor Ogundipe uh, of the University of uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos. And what we do is essentially in, we offer, uh, in our case, innovation grants to support startups that are using innovation to benefit the citizens of Lagos. So for example, one of our winners was Price Pally, uh, mm. where Pri what Price Pally does is it aggregates bulk buy and mm -hmm. use that mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. low end consumers who mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. would not have access mm -hmm. you know, to such volumes. Mm. No. I trust that helps. Yes, it does. Um, so as part of our activities in digital Africa, we work with startups to develop, accelerate, and grow their ideas. And some partnership with the Indian Network to provide access. I'm sorry, you mm -hmm. broke up there. Can you repeat the question? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you broke yes, up can there. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Okay, so I said as part of our activities in Digital Africa, we work with startups to develop, accelerate, and grow their ideas. Can we enter into some partnership with your angel network to provide access to funds for them? We, we're always looking for great entrepreneurs who are solving significant problems. Um, and especially those who are using technology to do so. And I personally would be more than happy at any time, you know, to meet any founder who is building something, you know, something significant in terms of um, technology enabled solutions. Interesting. So as I bring this session to a close, please can you share with us your personal vision for African startups? My personal vision for African startups is very simple. Solve a problem that creates value to as many people on the continent as possible. That's sort of the first rule of what needs to happen. Interesting. So I, I think we can now go into some um, question and answers before we round up um, today's meeting. But I already have a question from uh, Mr. Olushola Teniola, who says IoT, drones, 5G, clean energy, and or QoS, are these areas you're interested in investing or are they too risky for you? Um, I've actually got a clean energy investment already. It's called Power Stove. Um, funnily enough, it's out of Abuja. Uh, they are helping uh, in terms of carbon credit availability by creating um, non-fossil fuels based pellets that enable women in the villages to actually uh, be able to cook their food without burning our trees, etc., uh, and thereby issuing carbon credits. Um, I'm looking at a solar play, but I think solar is probably going to wait uh, in our case. 5G, I don't know enough about 5G. I'm still looking, looking to learn. And for drones, yes, we've, uh, we've actually looked at a couple of drone technology plays. One of them is in the health sector being used to deliver um, critical health care needs like blood uh, from central hospitals into a distributed area. Uh, so the answer is yes, these are areas we're constantly looking at. And by the way, thanks, uh, Mr. Teniola. I think what we'll do is send an email to you. With that, we have 
come to the end of um, the November edition of the Digital Africa VIP series. I want to appreciate everyone who has tuned in today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here with us. Tommy Davies, thank you so much for this interesting conversation. We look forward to seeing more of you during um, another VIP series. Follow me on Twitter. So with this? Yes. Okay, sure. We, would, uh, we have come to the end of the November edition. Thank you, everyone. See you in 2021.